Would you open up your Bibles, please? Second Peter chapter 2. Yes, till still. Might be two next week as well. I don't know, I don't know how to break away from this, from this book, I'll be honest. There's just so much in this. And, uh, and we don't want to miss this. And, and, and listen, and the reason that the church is in the state that it is in today is because we have missed this. We've missed this. We've, we've listened to false teachers. We've uh, absorbed false doctrine. We've made false doctrine like, like it's normal. And now we have believers that hear false doctrine and don't even know it's false doctrine. They, they take it in and, uh, that, that, that's, that's right, isn't that right? No, it ain't right. And listen, and some of those preachers that you used to listen to that were reliable no longer are. They have, man, they have flown the cuckoo's nest. They, they are, they're done, man. They're just... They're out there with some of the craziest things in the world. And uh, for you former Catholics that are happy that you broke away, that you got away, listen, there is a new, I don't even know how to describe it, an apostolic Catholic, I'm, I'm sorry, apostolic Roman Catholic movement. And it is diabolical. And guys like Francis Chan are in it. Yeah. It's, uh, it, this thing has just gone nuts. The old um, Acts 29 uh, church plant uh, that Mark Driscoll was a part of. Let me tell you something. These guys... Well, anyway. I, I don't want to go on bashing. But the truth is the truth is the truth. And here's the deal. There's only one truth. Not everybody has the truth. Well, they can have it. They just choose not to teach it. But 2 Peter chapter 2, he's warning. And let me tell you something. He's warning of apostates. You know, those that maybe were on fire at one time for the Lord and all of a sudden now have cooled off completely. Now they're just telling bold-faced lies. Let me tell you something. It paled in comparison to the false teachers that we have today. You can just type in a sermon, just John chapter 3, and bring up 20 different preachers. I guarantee you 17 of them will be heretical. Maybe 16. One will have no clue what he's talking about. The other three will be solid. Solid. And now we see, you know, we see the world going after even the solid pastors, claiming that they don't know what they're talking about. Gang, it's a messed up world. Be careful from which well you drink from. It matters, gang. It matters. I tell you week in, week out, maybe, well, maybe not every week, but often enough, don't trust anything I tell you. Go back and look into these things for yourself. After a while, you'll realize Hey, this guy's teaching truth. I mean, I don't like his delivery. He's a little crude. He's a little rough around the edges. <clears throat> I, I work with what I have. You know, I'm not too fond of his haircut. But, uh, man, but he tells the truth, and he, he's, he's, he's teaching the truth. You'll get to understand. You'll understand the flow of how I teach. I, I, I don't teach like everybody else. Um, but you'll notice, listen, the word is reliable but I didn't invent it. I, I find myself, I, I teach the way guys used to teach in the 1700s, in the 1800s. I, I don't know why. I'm just reading the next verse. I, I don't know how to take, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and I don't know how to turn that into, for there was a faraway planet with a butterfly. <laughs> and that butterfly came to earth and became the caterpillar in our souls. You think I'm kidding. That's the junk that some people are reading. Or 
they follow a different religion that says when you die, you're going to go inherit a planet with your wife. I have a hard time being in the same kitchen sometimes with my wife. A planet, and I love you, sweetheart. <laughs> it's just, it's insanity. But let's dive in. We've made it as far as verse 17. Yay. Would you join me in prayer, please? Father, we ask that our hearts would be rent before you. Lord, that you would help us, Lord. And Lord, I know that there are many people either watching online or here in this sanctuary, Lord, that have been hurt by false preachers. Ask that, Lord, you would somehow restore. Would you bless this time, Lord, as we seek your word? In Jesus' name, amen. Well, verse 17, again, just go back there for a second. Talking about these false preachers, talking about these men who are doing this dishonest stuff for financial gain, and that's what it boils down to. It's for financial gain. He says, these are like wells without water. If you've ever been dying of thirst and you went, a well, and you went to draw water and all you heard was the pail hit the bottom. Wow. What a disappointment. These are wells without water. Clouds carried by a tempest. And if you know that you're, and, and we got rain yesterday, right? Praise God. So many places in the United States, Lake Mead, just no rain, no rain. There are droughts happening everywhere. It's not being reported, but there are droughts happening everywhere. Obviously not here, not here. At one point last night, I went, you did say you weren't going to do this again. Because... <laughs> but gang, if your grass ever needed rain, if you've ever been through a drought and you see a storm cloud coming, you're like, we're going to get soaked. And then all of a sudden your house is engulfed in this huge black cloud. And it just keeps going. And no rain came from it. You're like, oh. And if you're a farmer, man, you understand what that's all about. That feels like a curse. Well, he says that's what these false preachers are like. They keep promising all of this stuff, but man, my, my life is falling apart. They keep telling me that, man, if I just pray for prosperity, I'm going to have it. You know, they say if I pray for an airplane, like he prayed for an airplane. He got an airplane. What do I get? The bill. Man, it's like clouds without water. He says, listen, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever? What's reserved? The blackness of darkness? The lake of fire. The lake of fire. And I can only imagine what a lake of fire would even be like. Do you understand, gang? Listen, your flesh... And, and not your flesh, but human flesh. Humans that decide, I don't want Jesus. I'm going to shine him on. I don't care about what his sacrifice was for me. And they'll go to hell. Over his dead body, but they'll go to hell. There are pastors that you watch on YouTube that will be here in this lake of fire. That's a bold statement, right? I was like, oh, man, really? Yeah. Yeah, that's what this is all about. And Peter, listen, as he's dying, he, saw, he said, this is the most important thing. This is the most important thing. I'm about to die, but I need to warn the church. I need to warn future brothers and future sisters, generations to come. I don't know how long it's going to be before the Lord comes, but I need to warn them. Don't listen to these guys. Don't be a part of that stuff. And these will burn their flesh on fire, but it's never consumed. And, and they go through this everlasting punishment. That's why you have so many teaching today. Yeah, but that's just a temporal situation. Their, their flesh will burn, but it's, it's temporal. It's just a little while. Well, where do you get that from? 
because I see where the flesh burns, but I read the word eternity. And I click on that little word on my computer and it means forever. Man, that's some scary stuff. And they say that teachers, and that's what this is about, get a stricter judgment. Stricter than lake of fire? You want to know why I'm, I, I don't do this to impress men? <laughs> it's because I'm living for him. Because he's who I answer to. At the end of the day, I'm going to stand before him and be held accountable for everything that I've taught. Not the way I taught. He gave me a personality. Praise God. But for what I taught. Did I look the other way on sin? Was there adultery in the church that I looked the other way? Were there things happening in the church that I just said, eh, I'm going to let that go? No. If it, now, if it's a matter of grace, yeah, we have to extend grace because Jesus extended grace. But when it comes to a matter of something that goes against the Word of God, no, no, we have to, we have to say something. We have to say something. All right, I got to move. All right. Verse 18, listen, for when they speak, when they speak, great swelling words of emptiness. That word emptiness could probably be better translated nothingness. Nothingness. And listen, you, again, you, you listen to that guy down in Houston, Texas, in that big arena, and I listen two, three minutes at a time until I puke, and I go, that guy just wasted three minutes of my life. And you know what he spoke? Nothing. Nothing. It's all nonsense. Jesus loves you. I already know that. I see it at the cross. There's nothing you can do to ever be out of his will. Really? Really? So if I go rob a liquor store right now, that must have been Jesus' will for my life. It's stupid. <laughs> Please don't encourage that kind of preaching. Anyway. <laughs> they allure through the lusts of the flesh. The lusts of the flesh. They allure. What, what does that mean? Oh, it's, it's about the clothes. You know, they don't understand how hip a Hawaiian shirt is. They don't get it. They think a leather jacket can compete. No. Skinny jeans. Blech. Right? And so what happens is the congregants, they wear skinny jeans. And if you're wearing skinny jeans today, man, God bless you. I don't know how you do it, but God bless you. You know? And, and so we, we want to be in a place where there's, there's no windows. So it looks more like a club. And we're going to play the music really, really loud. It's the lust of the flesh. We're going to promise people that they're going to be prosperous. We're going to promise people, listen, you don't need to bring a Bible. Why carry all that? Because this can save my life? Listen, through lewdness. And, and, and listen, and we see it. Just lewdness. Telling brothers in the church, hey, we're going to get together for a Bible study at a bar and we're going to drink beers at the same time. Just to be kind of like culturally relevant. It's, it's maddening, gang. It's maddening. Please don't speak about the cross of Jesus Christ. We don't want to hear old rugged cross. <laughs> Listen to me. I guarantee you don't hear that song too much on a Sunday anymore. Unless it's a Southern Baptist church somewhere. I'll give you that. Listen, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. Listen, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. Slaves of corruption. I can't stop. I can't stop asking for money. I've created this lifestyle now. And how am I going to feed it if I don't ask for money? And the church then becomes just a money market, man. 
And how many people do you know that won't go to a church? Because why? They just want your money. I mean, honestly, can we blame them for feeling that way? How many people have just been absolutely just railroaded for money? Now, it costs money to do ministry. I'll give you that. But if your church can't survive on what God is bringing in, and you're just keeping it alive with loans or selling off property. Is God in that? Because God's not broke. If everybody decided today they're not going to give any more to this church, I promise you, God would find a way to drop a helicopter here full of cash. Just land right on the property. Here you go. I don't know why I'm doing this, but it's all yours. Why? Because it's his. It's his. And if the day comes where we all lose our jobs, well, man, then we'll just open up the windows, light some candles, and do church. Do church. Because it has to be, this whole thing has to be bigger than the dollar. And I know that that's not popular preaching today. I get it. I understand. But you know, I don't, I don't see the guys from 200 years ago worrying about money. I don't see the, the Finneys worried about money. Spurgeon. Spurgeon. I, one of the most wealthiest churches around. I never asked for any money. He didn't have to. But that's what drives them. Man, they're slaves of corruption. Slaves of corruption. You know, and, and even while they sometimes talk against money from the pulpit, if you look at their private lives, you go, dude, you got two houses. One's worth three million, one's worth five million. What are you talking about living within your means? You know, I remember when I bought our first house at a million dollars. It was a, It was hard. Some of you are like, really? No. No. My, my, my house is a, well, it's a nice house. I like it. My house is so nice that when the rapture comes, I'm going to be like, what house? Right? We just don't live that way. I don't want to love things in this life more than I ever love heaven, man. No way. No way. Let me get back to the word. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. Now, again, th these are ones that they teach things they should not be teaching. Like having multiple wives is okay. Um, and I'm not picking on anybody, but, you know, they, they, teach, uh, they teach that, man, we're going to go through the wrath. We're going to go through the wrath, and then God will come. Man, everywhere in my scripture, everywhere I turn, it says that I wasn't appointed to wrath. So if God has appointed me to wrath, that means I'm not saved. Or am I saying that God's a liar? Uh, no, I think the easier way to say it is, no, God, I'm going to take you at your word. I'm not appointed to wrath. You said you're coming back for me. I read in, in, in 1 Thessalonians where you're taking me out of this world. Lord, I'm going to believe that, but yet you have so many preachers that it's popular now to have a different opinion. And then they go on YouTube, they get more plays. Or you have these guys that impersonate pastors that start talking about a flat earth. And how many people in our society today 
in 2022 believe in a flat earth theory. And it's being taught from pulpits. The blackness of darkness. Why? Because we're calling God a liar whenever we teach something contrary to Scripture. Oh, and they'll twist Scripture. And they'll try to tell you, see, here in Scripture, and I don't want to get on this topic, but here in Scripture, they talk, this talks about flat earth. Listen to me. No, it does not. No, it does not. And listen, because I would be fascinated if it did. But I went down that wormhole, and you know what I discovered? Not true. Not true. And it just so happens, listen, I've got a cousin. International Space Station? Hey, dude, tell me the truth. Earth flat? He goes, have you lost your mind? And sends back pictures to my email, and I go, nope, not flat. I'd love to get him to teach, uh, to come to, he's, he's, a, he's a believer. I'd love to just come and speak at our church, man. That would be so cool. But anyway. Verse 20 is a scary verse, and I hope you pay attention to it. For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, listen, and how did they escape? Through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ that they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. A stricter judgment. What's it saying? Man, for those who have been enlightened, those that have been... Now, and there, there, there is a theological argument here. Is he talking about those that have just heard about Jesus? are convinced that Jesus is Savior but never gave their life or for those that have been saved. In the context of what Peter is writing, he's talking about false teachers. Now, they didn't grow up young men going, oh, one day I'm going to be a false teacher. I can't wait. No, that means at one time they knew the truth and they had to study the Scriptures and they deliberately twisted them. Why? Puts money in the pocket. So in this case that we're talking about people that know Jesus Christ, had knowledge of Jesus Christ, and were saved through Jesus Christ. He says, listen, it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. Now, you want to talk about the danger of false teaching? The danger of, of wicked shepherds? And it was always like this. Jeremiah, Jeremiah, Jeremiah. Not the bullfrog. Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23. Put a marker in uh, 2 Peter slash 2 Timothy, whatever it is. Jeremiah 23, we're going back to Pete. But I want you to see this. God care? Yeah, God cares. That's why 2 Peter is written the way it is. But in Jeremiah 23... Jeremiah the prophet gets a word from Jehovah God. And he says, listen, I want you to preach and I want you to tell them this for me. He says, woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. I'm not speaking of sheep, he's speaking of people, says the Lord. And you'll notice that's in all caps. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel against the shepherds who feed my people. You have scattered my flock You've driven them away, not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doings, says the Lord. But I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their folds. 
and they shall be fruitful and increase. I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. And I pause and go back to 2 Peter. What's God saying? Hey, look, supernaturally, this is what I'm going to do. These people have had shepherds that have abused them. They got involved in a movement. They had to come and speak to the high pastor, bringing their W-2s. They had to pay for memberships. They got their seat, and then they have a name on the back of the seat, so it belongs to their family, and they pay that fee every year. That's happening in churches. God says, man, woe to you. And we see when Jesus spoke and he said, woe to you, it was woe. This is God saying, woe to you. I'm watching what the shepherds are doing. I'm watching that you're, you're taking widows' homes. You're taking widows' homes. Oh, my brother Mike died. Mike Flaherty and left Angela a widow. I was thinking, well, the shepherds in Jesus' day, they used to take the widow's homes. Not only did she keep her home, but she had started living in ours. <laughs> I'm not sure how that happened. Where are you, Angela? Where are you? Oh, there she is. All right. We changed the seats. I didn't know where you went. I didn't know if you got lost or something, you know. No, no, see, what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to take them in. We're supposed to take them in. We don't, we don't take widows and abuse them. Well, we kind of abuse them, but in a good, loving way. <laughs> no, we take them in. We make them part of our family. And I'd always loved Mike and Angela, you know. But once, once Mike passed, it became our responsibility to take care of our own. So every birthday, every Christmas, every... Every anniversary, every weekend. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine, it's fine. No, we, we, it's, it's a family, gang. It's a family. You know, and there's a good way to shepherd and there's a wrong way to shepherd. You know, we don't, we don't take people's houses. We don't shake people down. That's the old life, that's not the new life. No, there's a way to shepherd. You come alongside people. Some people need to... A, a square kick in the tail and other people need an arm around them and that's what shepherding is all about and the ones that you had to kick in the tail hopefully you get to the point where you go man I love you I'm glad you're back lost lost way too many brothers man to the world that have turned away from the things of the Lord and went chasing after man what the world has and sometimes they get away from here and they hit rock bottom and I love hearing stories of how they turned it back around. I love that. That's awesome. It would, be, it would have been better, verse 21 says, for them not to know the way of righteousness than having to know it. To turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. You know, there is scripture. Oh. Let's go there. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. I think Matthew chapter 12 really um, hits home uh, for me because I believe that this was my life at one point um, after I had uh, walked away. Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 Matthew 12, 43 says, now this is Jesus, Lord and Savior speaking. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, well, how does that happen? How does that happen? Get saved. Get saved. You get saved, and the unclean spirit that was leading you to hell must depart. It's beautiful. And listen, why do we baptize? Because when you get baptized, you're identifying now in Jesus' death, you come up out of that water and you can say to the demons, you ain't welcome here no more. 
You understand? You understand? That's why we baptize. For those of you that were sleeping, I apologize. Go ahead. Resume. <laughs> now listen, when he goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, arid places. What does that mean exactly? I don't know. I don't want to visit the arid places. That's why I don't go to Arizona. Here it's nice and humid. No demons, I don't know. And what are they doing? They're seeking rest. There is no rest for demons, by the way. And he finds none. Then he says, I'll return to my house from which I came. You know, uh, I don't know. There's no Pablos here. Anybody named Pablo here? No, we use Pablo. Pablo used to smoke weed. He used to, you know, take some, you know, pills that would make him trip. You know, yeah, I know he got saved, but you know what? He wants me back. Let me go visit Pablo. Look what happens. And when he comes, he finds it empty. Why? That's, how, that's the condition Jesus left it in. Empty, swept, and put in order. Why? Because everything was out of order. And he goes, and he takes with him, listen, seven other spirits more wicked than himself. Now, now why is that? Why does Jesus say that? I'm going to tell you why. Because that demon is afraid that he's going to try to enter this body again, and he's going to come in contact with Jesus Christ again. Do you understand? Punks will always grab a small party to fight because they don't like to fight one-on-one. -on -one. There was a time when this spirit was living within the man, let's say this man, and I said, yes, I need to get saved. And Jesus Christ showed up in this temple. And I don't know exactly the fight that took place. It wasn't much of one. But that demon got body slammed, booted right out of me. And he comes back and he sees clean. And this is what happened to me, gang. He sees clean. Oh, it's in order. He's actually going to sleep at normal times. And, and then he started speaking into my ear. Come on, these people aren't for you. You don't mix in. These are nice people. Come on, you're going to start singing these songs? Jesus, lover of my soul. Come on, that don't even make sense. Love of my soul. What is this game music? What are we doing here? Literally. And Satan started whispering in my ear. The church ain't for me. Oh, man, the church ain't for me. Oh, no, 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 you're saved, but that's not for you. You need to go find something for you. And you know what I found? Nothing. Nothing. I was in the right place. But I wasn't willing to hang in there. Because the sermons, they were hitting home. The sermons were directed and they were pointed. Why? Because it was the Word of God. It wasn't what he was saying. It's what the Word of God was saying. And all of a sudden, gang, listen, I walked away. And I went back to the world. Why? Because I had to earn. i got to make money. I'm not making money right now. I'm playing Christian and, man, the, the money's running out. I went back to the world. And it says it takes seven demons with him. Why? In case Jesus shows back up, now we got seven demons that he's going to have to fight. Thinking, listen, they were already fooled by, uh, by Satan once, Lucifer once, when they fell in their rebellion. Jesus ain't coming back. Come on, let's go. Listen, seven spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter, listen, and they dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. And listen, for me, I'm ashamed to tell you, it was. It was. And I hated to a whole new depravity level. Hey, I was angrier than ever before. I was willing to fight anybody and everybody, almost daring people. Come on, let's go. I don't know how I wasn't shot dead. I don't, just God's plan for my stupid life. So I tell you, I come up here and I preach and there's nobody that feels more unworthy to do this. Nobody. And, I, and I, it's like week in, week out. I'm like, Lord, you can change your mind at any time. I'll still love you forever. The state of that man is worse than the first. Now listen, go back to 2 Peter for me. But 
God doesn't stop chasing. God doesn't stop chasing. And God chased me. And he chased me, and he chased me, and he chased me. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you what God did. I, go, go to Hebrews Go to, go to Hebrews 6. See, this is what happens when you don't have notes and you preach without notes. This is what happens. I don't recommend it. I don't recommend it. I'm going I'm to start having notes and stuff. The problem is I want to put down notes and I'll be like, mm, okay, no, we don't need that. Okay, so, because this has to be a Holy Spirit inspired thing. But let me tell you what happened. My own personal story, my own personal life. I started reading my Bible again. Now, still full blown in my sin, I was still out there, and I was making more money now. I was making more money now than I had before. To the tune of about sixty, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 a week. And I pay out my crew very, very little. I was stingier then than, than, than I had ever been before. But I picked up my Bible. And a friend gave it to me when I got saved. And I picked it up, and when I picked it up, it felt like an old friend. I went, wow. I don't need this anymore, and I put it down. I looked at it, and I, I picked it up, and I put it down. True story. Picked it up, and I did what most of you do, Bibleopoly. You know, where you just go anywhere. <laughs> Well, the back of the book is always better than the front of the book, I always thought. So I started going to the back of the book. And I came to this Hebrews. And I went, Hebrews, I'll read about a bunch of Jews. This will have nothing to do with me. So I thought. Chapter 6, verse 4. For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. If they fall away, it's impossible if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. And I read that. And immediately I went, oh no. I said, I can't, I can't be saved. I've thrown away my salvation. And man, I was a mess. And that was a Saturday morning. I remember living a tortured life that afternoon, that evening. I didn't sleep. And I went back to my church on that Sunday morning. The first service, I'd never been to a first service. What is that all about? Eight o'clock and I was there. And I sat like you in the second row. I didn't, nobody comes to the first row. I sat in the second row. And I was standing there or sitting there, and Pastor Bob was, was, was preaching. And I didn't know that he knew me from anything or anybody. The only time until then that I really had contact with him was when I got saved. And uh, he had opened up in his sermon, and he started, you know, he, he used to take out the, the thing and, and, and read his bulletin. Remember that? For those of you that went to Fort Lauderdale, he used to read his bulletin, he put it down. And just as he was opening up to his sermon, he looked over at me and he went, oh, good to see you back. He's talking to me? Good to see me back. I didn't know I left. And then I was like, oh. And at the end, at the end of the service, I got up there and I rededicated my life again. And gang, listen to me. I don't know what took place 
with those seven demons that walked into that church with me. But I know I was never the same. I was never the same. I could feel the battle going on in me. So here's the hope. Because you read the scripture, you go, yeah, but according to the scripture, that's not true. Well, according to the scripture, I must not have lost my salvation. According to the scripture, I must have still been one with Christ, only I wasn't living like it. For those of you that have a loved one that is living for hell right now, don't give up and don't stop praying. Don't stop praying. Jesus loves them. Absolutely loves them. Pray for them. Pray for them. I am proof that, man, you can say to hell with the world and live for Jesus Christ. You can. The world will pull you back. The world will try to get its claw, its grip into you. Say no. I don't want to be a selfish person. I don't want to be a self-centered person. I don't want to live for me. I want to live for others. I want to be the best dad and husband that I can possibly be. I don't want to live like this. I don't want to live for marijuana. I don't want to live for alcohol. Lord Jesus, I want to live for you, Lord. I gave you my life, but I've never really given you my life. Give it to him. Let him take it so that you're not like the proverb. Here the proverb says, listen, but it happened to them according to the true proverb. A dog returns to his own vomit and a sow, a pig, having washed to her wallowing and in the mire. Listen, I've never owned a pig. Floyd has owned pigs. One thing I can guarantee you that Floyd did not do was bring his pig in the house and give it a bath. Spray some high karate cologne. Put a bow around its neck. Because he knows that pig is going to run right back to the slop. Because that's what they do. Again, speaking about false teachers and those that follow false teachers, they're going to do what they're going to do. But for you, you have a choice. You have a choice. Listen, it's not easy to get up every morning and start reading the Word. I know what it's like. Sometimes it's a, it's a battle. Oh, it'd be much easier to get a, I don't know, like a pep talk or something on a Sunday be so much easier to tell me that, man, my life right now, I'm about to be a millionaire. That sounds great. But it's a bunch of lies so that men can get rich. And if you look at their lifestyles, gang, if you look at all of these prosperity teachers, this, this, this the big one down here in, in Charlotte with all the campuses, How is it okay that a servant of God has a multi-million dollar home with I don't know how many thousand square feet? When, when, I don't, I, I don't, I don't know what, what's happened to our minds. As people who feed that, I don't know. I don't know. And, and, and I don't understand it. I truly don't understand it because I say, where, where's the fear of God? Where's the fear of God? I'm looking, I'm looking for someone to give me a plane. I don't want to pay for it. I don't want to pay for it. I want somebody to give me a plane. Why? Because I have a pilot already. I heard that Mindy is just, she got a pilot's license. And I'm her pastor. And I know how to put, you know, a, a little bit of the weight on her. You know, like, hey, Mindy, come on, I'm doing this for God. You'd fly me, wouldn't you, Mindy? <laughs> Be praying for Mindy. Be praying that she gets a, a, a license so she can fly a jet. And then be praying that somebody gives me a jet. 
I mean, I don't have anywhere to go. I just want to say I got one. You know what I mean? I'm joking if this is your first time here or watching online. I wouldn't get up in a plane with Mindy, right? Why? No, I didn't. No. <laughs> no, I did have to go visit a cousin this week in the hospital and I saw a helicopter pilot. This guy's supposed to be the best around. And I'm telling you right now, that helicopter looked like it was about to wreck. I'm like, you know what? I do a lot of crazy things in my life. I'll ride a motorcycle when I used to. At high speeds. Helicopter? I ain't getting in that thing. That's like a slow death. Mm. <laughs> Who wants that? You know what I mean? That's like living in a house with two mother-in-laws. That's, what are you, crazy? <laughs> Who said that? Who said that? <laughs> I'm ending early. We're not gonna touch chapter three. I lied this morning when I told people, I think I can get all the way to chapter three. I meant it. I wasn't intentionally lying. I just can't do it. There's too much here. There's too much here. Gang, listen to me. If you're in a place this morning that you say to yourself, man, my, my walk really stinks. My walk is just horrible. I'm, I'm just, man, I'm living the life of a phony believer. I don't trust God. I don't really seek God. I do things that, man, I'm ashamed of myself. How much more is God is looking on? I need help. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to exit the pulpit here as I go and prepare for baptism with uh, Pastor Matt, who will be assisting me. And we're going to have a prayer team up here. I'm inviting you, if you have never, ever given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm inviting you up here to pray. I'm inviting those who are watching online to take this opportunity to recommit their lives to Jesus Christ. Our time here is so stinking short that we need to be prepared. We're about to meet the one. The one that we've talked about, the one that we've dreamed about, the one that we've read about, the one who started it all, who did it all, who bled for all. We're about to meet him face to face. Nobody wants to do that, being ashamed of their lifestyle. If you've never given your life, I'm inviting you to come up here and give your life to the Lord today. Then you can go get baptized. You say, oh, I didn't bring clothes. I'll buy the clothes you're wearing. With my million dollar salary, I can afford that. <laughs> can I make installment payments? I'm just saying. And if you're, if you're ice cold, listen, this is just family. If you're too embarrassed to come forward and say, Man, I need to start living more for Jesus Christ and stop living for myself. Man, there'll be people up here to pray with you. Man, to bring you back home. God loves it when we come back home. And if you need to rededicate your life and you really want to get baptized again, then I invite you to do that. And if you've never been baptized, you've never been water baptized, you need to be water baptized. Not because I said so. Not, not because we get special credit with Calvary Chapel and, you know, they'll send us a check. No, because it's been commanded by Jesus Christ. It's been commanded. As believers, we need to do this submitting to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, we have no business calling ourselves believers. Is it necessary for salvation? We covered that on Wednesday. No, it's not. No, it's not. But what kind of salvation do you have if you can't make a public declaration for Jesus? Have we said goodbye to the online audience? God, goodbye, online audience. We love you. Father, have your way in this place right now. 
Lord, bless your church. Lord, speak. Speak to us, Lord. Speak to your people, Lord. Lord, we need you in this place. And Lord, we want you in this place. So fill us, Lord, please. Holy Spirit, just take control of every heart in this room. And speak to us, Lord. In Jesus' name.